Good afternoon and welcome to today's planning committee. This is not a public meeting, but a meeting the public can attend. I'm Councillor Susan Durant, Chair of the Planning Committee. Before we commence, I'd like to outline the domestic arrangements for the meeting. We're not expecting a fire practice today. If the alarm sounds, please leave the building by way of the fire exit through the doors at the rear of the chamber on my right. When you've left the chamber, proceed down the stairway and exit through the emergency exit on the ground floor. If there is anybody with mobility issues, please wait in the refuge area at the top of the stairs, where the emergency evacuation lift is located and use the intercom situated to the left-hand side of the lift door to call for assistance. The designated assembly point is in the public square in front of CAS beyond the fountain. I'd like to inform members of the public and press that today's meeting will be audio visually recorded. By entering the council chamber, you accept that you will be recorded and your images retained and broadcast by the council on its website and on YouTube. If anyone intends to record or film any part of today's meeting, please ensure that this does not disturb the conduct of the meeting and you only focus on recording those people participating. Please ensure that your mobile phones are switched to silent mode. May I remind anyone speaking in the meeting that you will need to press the large red button underneath the microphone and ensure the red light is illuminated. This will ensure that you are recorded. The meeting is proceeding today on the basis that all members of the committee have read their agenda papers thoroughly and are aware of what they will be considering today. If any members of the committee leave the chamber during consideration of an application, they should ensure they do not take part in the vote on their return as they will not have heard all the relevant information on that particular item. Thank you. Item one is apologies for absence. We have Councillor Amy Dixon, Councillor Duncan Anderson, Councillor Bob Anderson and Councillor Andy Pickering. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Item two is exclusion of the public and press. There are no exempt items on today's agenda. Item three is declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest, please? Councillor Cox? Um, ward member for the application in Finley. Thank you for, for that. Okay, so first of all, <coughs> item four, minutes of the last committee meeting held on the 23rd of August, 2022. Can the minutes be moved as a true and accurate record? Is that seconded? And is that agreed? Thank you. Item five, we now come to the schedule of applications. Application one is planning application 21 oblique 02365 oblique FULM. It's the erection of a residential development of 27 dwellings on land southwest of the junction at First Avenue and Hayfield Lane in Orkley. And Gary Hildersley, the planning officer, will introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll just give you a quick overview as to what we've got. So it's a planning application that some of you may recall uh, was presented to planning committee at the last month's planning committee for the erection of 27 dwellings off First Avenue Hayfield Lane at Orkley. Uh, the application was deferred for several reasons, uh, primarily for a site visit to take a look at the off-site drainage issues um, I'm mindful that members who attended the site visit on Friday, it was very dry, uh, and so there wasn't a puddle on site, but this is a, a photo uh, that I took earlier uh, in August. Uh, you can see um, the, the pooling effect that's taking place there at the junction between First Avenue and Hayfield Lane, uh, and that's marked on the plan on the right-hand side. Um, members will obviously recall uh, me pointing out on site that that's primarily due to issues of uh, silting up of the existing drainage network on First Avenue and the capacity issue, uh, particularly at that junction of First Avenue and uh, Hayfield Lane. Secondly, the application was deferred to assess and have a look at the proximity of the site to nearby uh, sustainable transport methods. So you can see here uh, and as we saw on site on Friday, there are a number of bus stops in close proximity to the application site, uh, and they're marked here. They're served primarily by the number 57 bus, uh, 57A as well, uh, and they will lead 
uh, to and from Doncaster fairly regularly. Uh, it's outlined in the report how often they are. Thirdly, it was deferred so that we could have a look at the proximity of the application site to uh, surrounding schools. So we walked on Friday up Hayfield Lane towards uh, the Hayfield Lane Primary School. Uh, and we also were able to witness the Doncaster College Hayfield School sites as well in close proximity to the application site. Fourthly, there was a request for additional information in relation to the abnormal costs associated with the uh, BT cable relocation. So we've got uh, a breakdown there of how that £176,000 uh, of abnormal costs is derived. It's primarily direct labour costs, uh, you've got some contract costs as well, and some material costs, and then VAT on top of it, uh, and that, that attributes the is a breakdown of the £176,000 abnormal cost. So in terms of just a refresher of what we've got application wise, um, this is a slide that shows a location of the objections. So we've had 10 letters of objection. Um, you can see here that they are primarily received from um, the properties to the west of the application site um, on Hayfield Court. Uh, the other properties that have made objections to the application are beyond the scope of where that slide or that map shows the application site and, and other properties. So it's it's really um, focused on, on those properties, as I say, to the, to the west of the application site. Members will recall at the last committee meeting, I gave a quick update in terms of where we've come from and where we are now. So this was the original scheme I submitted. Um, so you can see it was originally for 28 uh, units and a uh, key consideration as part of that application was the central band of, of trees uh, that again, members will have seen on, out on site on Friday morning. Um, the amended scheme has now kept the vast majority of those trees, altered the uh, alignment of the road into the site and has reduced the quantum of development by one. So we've gone from 28 dwellings to 27. And this gives you a, a kind of refresher as to what that's made up of. So kind of clockwise, you've got the four storey flats on the top right hand corner. Then you move on to two storey terrace properties, uh, two storey detached in the bottom right hand corner two-storey terrace bottom left uh, and again a block of three terrace properties at two-storey in the middle at the left and then two detached uh, properties top left hand corner. Uh, I also at the last presentation gave it a quick uh, update as to tree replacement so the uh, development of the site will inevitably lead to some tree loss albeit that the amended scheme has looked to uh, keep the majority of the most valued trees on site. So it was important both for uh, the local planning authority and for the applicants that the replacement trees weren't displaced elsewhere within the borough but were in, in fact kept within the same ward um, and so the uh, applicant has looked to liaise with uh, Hill House School and has been able to uh, secure uh, the ability to plant 55 trees off site in the locations uh, shown on this slide, so location two and three. Uh, location one is the application site. So just in terms of refreshers to what the application uh, housing types looks like, so you've got uh, two-storey terraced here. You've got detached properties, three block of three terrace properties, block of four terrace properties, the elevations for the flats, and the detached. And then for the benefit of those who weren't able to attend the site visit on Friday, a uh, quick overview as to kind of site characteristics again. So this is a view taken from Hayfield Lane looking back towards the site. So you can see the kind of treescape that you've got on site uh, across the corner in the junction. This is uh, of the existing access looking westwards. This is the existing access looking northwards, the central band of trees, back towards the application entrance. 
south towards Meteor House. Uh, from the north of the site across the what was the former car park back towards the existing trees. Again, top left hand corner back towards the existing trees. And then westwards across the old car park towards the properties on Hayfield Court. And then southeastwards across the uh, previous car park towards the junction on First Avenue. So the recommendation remains the same. Uh, it is to grant planning permission subject to the signing of a section 106 agreement. Um, we did discuss at the last meeting that the application site was subject to a viability appraisal that has demonstrated that the site is not viable for all policy asks. Uh, that's been independently assessed. It's been determined that there's 7,000 pounds that's capable of being achieved as a result of this development, largely in, as a result of the abnormal costs. Um, the site is a brownfield site in that it has been previously developed. It lies within a residential policy area and as such, uh, the principle of residential development is acceptable. Uh, the scheme has been amended to incorporate the key features, uh, namely the existing trees on site and the, development, the quantum of development has been reduced uh, further in order to accommodate that. There have been no objections from any consultees. Uh, the site's located within a sustainable location and the MPPF is quite clear that there is a presumption in favor of sustainable development. Um, whilst it's acknowledged that there is viability uh, issues associated with the proposal, they're not considered to be outweighed by the positive aspects of the scheme. Uh, and in light of that, the recommendation is to grant subject to the signing of a section 106 agreement in relation to off-site tree uh, contributions and uh, it is affordable housing contributions as it stands at the moment, but as decision makers, it's within your gift as to, as to whether you feel that it's best spent on education. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Fred, Gary. Uh, the first person that we've got to speak is Councillor Alan Jones. So you've got five minutes. We'll start recording when you press the large red button and we'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Of course you are. Thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to speak. Um, I just want to add some background initially to this uh, application. I think it's 10 years since we started looking at trying to resolve these problems at this junction. And I know we're, we're talking outside of the uh, line, the red lines on, on the application. But I, I think it's important that we consider what's outside that red line, as we do with education and travel and all the rest of those other parts that go uh, to forming parts of the community. Uh, and I, I'll refer to 8, uh, 8.28 uh, in the document as uh, what I consider unacceptable on highway safety. And I've got photographs, many more photographs, and worse ones than what you've shown on that drawing about that junction. First of all, when it rains like that, there's no means of getting across where there's a, a proper means to get across with the traffic lights and a, a, and actually crossing actually you know put in place for that reason and the access uh, from the the actual um, um, estate comes out at, at that point virtually where the water is on my drawing it, it, it comes out well, a lot further up uh, than what you've shown there on the, on the actual drawing in fact it, it's you can't walk, you cannot walk on the footpath past the hedge. There's no, there's no way you can, uh, any with people with pushchair or an invalid can get, get by there. So on, on my point of view, the, the, the actual aspect of uh, making sure this is resolved before any work is done on that estate is of prime importance. And I, I, I don't know um, whether um, planning accept um, that the, there are eight standards within uh, highways. Um, 
uh, uh, whether that's applied to this process of, of looking at uh, uh, safety. Um, there are eight. It says, first of all, you've got substantial, uh, considerable, significant, moderate, modest, limited, and limit little or no issues. Now, I consider this to be significant. Therefore, the work should be uh, help, any work on that estate should be held up until that significant work is overcome and that's that that goes back to my interpretation uh, whether you planning committee make the same I've no idea um, and the other one is that uh, within the proposals there's no uh, um, actually um, discussions about the, the employment levels on on the in relation to the airport and all the rest of any buildings that would be put up should be have a a, um, a, a set of um, application refer to employment requirements within the LDP regardless You've of size. You've got one minute remaining. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> you had one minute. Okay. Uh, do, do any committee members have any questions at all for Councillor Jones? No. Okay. Thank you for your time. Okay, we've now got Miss Melissa Kroger, the applicant from Fenwood Estates Limited, was requested to speak in support of the application. Yep. Uh, this is now your opportunity to, to address the committee for five minutes. Please press the large red button when you want to speak. And you press it again to mute your microphone when you've concluded, and we'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Melissa Kroger. I'm Managing Director at Fenwood Estates Limited. Um, as my father, Graham Fennell, and Amy from Turley's um, gave an introduction to who we are as Fenwood um, and what we're about and the details of the proposed site last time, uh, I'm not going to go over those points uh, at this committee. However, I will briefly explain what we've conducted at our end, taking on board the points that were raised at the last meeting. So, um, following on from last month's committee, we've now had confirmation from the Education Authority that there is current capacity at the local Hayfield Primary School. Um, and with this, um, we will propose, as Gary mentioned, to uh, transfer the £7,000 worth of income available from the site to be made as a contribution to the secondary school. Um, notwithstanding this, we've undertaken further research to identify both walking distances and routes to other nearby schools which fall within the Education Authority's uh, recommended walking distances. Um, and there are bus routes also to these alternate schools from the bus stop adjacent to the site. So we've looked a little bit further into that and, and hope that we've, we've uh, brought forward and uh, answered any queries with that. Um, I note that the concerns that were raised last time with regards to the surface water um, and I don't know whether this was put forward last time, but um, an agreement as part of our legal purchase of the site, we do have an agreement with Peel and it's tied into the contract of the purchase of the land that they use um, all endeavours to um, put an application in and sort out the surface water with the circle ways. In fact, there's an application in now with DMBC um, to, to uh, negate this problem. We're based just up the road. I've been in the area for 20 years and it is a real problem. Um, I walk to a, a local PT session just in Armstrong House and you can't, you're right, you can't walk down the, the pathway. So I made it a mission of mine as a local business owner and obviously we want to sell these homes. We don't want, uh, purchasers won't buy the homes if they see flooding on the, the part of the road. So I made it a mission to tie it up into the legal process that Peel must, at their cost, uh, sort out the surface water and apply for it before we even exchange contracts. Um, we exchange contracts and um, they have. We've, we've got um, a proposal in place to tie in our drainage, the outside circleway drainage and fetching, we've got to bring the point of connection electricity all down Hayfield Lane which will include a road closure and we're going to tie it in all together so that residents, there's no upheaval of keep closing the road, fixing things, different people doing different works at different times. So I've worked really hard to bring that together, one, to get rid of the issue because it's a massive issue, 
two to sell the homes and three to coordinate so that everybody's not in upheaval with the school runs and everything else that goes on in that location. So I have sent further details over to Gary and I've got a, a full report that Peel did um, on the um, trial holes and stuff to come to a design. It's a very robust design um, with uh, incorporating massive concrete rings at a couple hundred thousand pounds. So it's a massive robust system and I've made sure of that so that we can sell the homes in peace without this issue. So that may box off some more concerns with that. Um, overall, I'd like to reiterate the scheme uh, we feel is well thought out, designed with care and to complement the local area. It is a sustainable location um, and of course it makes good use of an infield brownfield site. Um, with the site being obviously brownfield, we've got the high cost of the abnormal uh, elements on there. One um, minute remaining. One of these is, uh, of which is the open reach cable that flows right across the centre of the site. We've got much more detail on that uh, uh, as well, but the cost associated is a direct cost to open reach and the management cost of connectors to coordinate it. Um, that's all being triggered now to divert it around the site so that we can get on and get it out of the way to not cause again any upheaval once we start to develop. Um, and, um, uh, and so we've boxed that off uh, along the way, but at a cost, hence the viability assessment. Um, but I do hope your site visit went well uh, last Friday and has appeased some concerns. But I'm here, fire any questions at me. Uh, I've been at the forefront of the acquisition landwise, so I'm probably the best person to, to fire anything at. So welcome any comments. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, Councillor Hogarth. Can you just tell me how many of the properties will be one bedroom? There's two one bedroom on there, the um, two apartments. Take it. They, they all meet the space standards. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Councillor Cox. Thank you. Um, firstly, you, you, you've stated there that Peel are going to meet all the costs for the drainage issue. Yes. And your drainage fund site is going to go into. Uh, our drainage insight uh, on our site won't go into it, but when we do our drainage works and coordinate um, a groundworks company to to carry out the works, we're going to coordinate with Peel to use the same contractor to do the outside works and our inside works. So the deal from our end is that we'll oversee, Peel are paying for their outside works, we'll pay for our internal works, but we, we'll oversee it personally that, and coordinate it rather than obviously leaving any trust with, with Peel. Um, so it's all tied in. It, it's in our contract clause 9.1 and 9.2 of our legal, per, uh, of, of the purchase contract. That they will pay 100%? They will pay 100% of the cost for their outside works, yes. Nothing so, to do with our inside. So where does that, does any of that cost come back to the authority? I've um, not had anything to do with that. I don't, the application's in as far as I, in our contract it just states, in fact I'll just, if you don't mind, I've just screenshot the clauses um, that stipulate that they not only have to, at its own cost, and, and the works to a standard obviously that's acceptable by us as well because we're developing on the site. Um, and um, that the um, the works, the application has to be in, it's in now, so they've ticked that box and the works have to coordinate with our drainage so that before occupation on site, it's all um, sort of in line, coordinated and, and conducted together. So. Thank you. Okay. And sec secondly, sorry Chair, just a, another quick one, is you say that the work's been triggered to move that cable. Yes. You don't yet have an application. No. So we have to put. Uh, we have to accept the quotation from uh, Open Reach um, through Connectus, and it sits there until uh, obviously to, if as soon as we, as and when we get a, a permission on the site, we are legally obliged to buy the site, and then we trigger it so that whilst we're in the legal system, the uh, lead time for Open Reach to get on site can occur, uh, and all time in. It's very sort of hard to fine tune the timings, but. Is that site actually yours at this point in time? We've, in, we've exchanged on the site um, currently and obviously we're legally complete on the site on granted planning. Right, so it's, it's not yours yeah. at the moment? No, but we're, we're legally okay. tied in under Thank the you. exchange. Yeah. Do we have any other councillors wishing to ask a question? Okay, thank you for your time.
councillors going into debate. Any questions for the officers? I'm going to start with Councillor Stapleton, then Councillor Hogarth, and Councillor Beach. Thank you, Chair. Um, obviously, we, one of my, my concerns, probably shared by other members of the committee, was the the, uh, the, the drainage issue at the crossing, because obviously we know vehicles, and I've seen them go into the right hand lane to turn left, and that's a frequent thing. And then, obviously, even the, the representative from the developers are saying that even, you know, she's accepting that. You can't physically walk down that path when it's flooded, so it's it's great to hear them say that that's been mitigated. But I just want to check. Obviously, I'm, I'm accepting what's been said. But I'd just like to know from the officer: Can you confirm what we're being told that 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 has been agreed? That so, in other words, this will all be resolved before any works starts or, or occupation of the site. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stapleton. Uh, it's pr probably a couple of things to pick up there. One. It lies outside the application site, as I think it's been referred to previously. So it do, it's not within the control of uh, the applicant. To the proposal as it's been put forward, it doesn't. It's not of the applicant's making. So this issue has has been there. This development proposal isn't affecting that because it's effectively washing its own face. Um, and three, it falls outside the scope of planning. So it would be a drainage application. Uh, for which drainage would assess it. Um, there isn't a requirement for them to undertake the works as part of this development. So it, everything that you're hearing today from uh, the applicant is in effect a bonus. What they're going to do is uh, resolve or solve that issue through a separate uh, mechanism in effect, but there's no planning requirement for them to do that. Um, that will have to be assessed as part of, of, of that due process. Can I just make you aware we've also got Adam Porter here as well from Drainage Digital. Got any questions specifically to the drainage part? Of it? I just got one really quick come back on that one. Can you confirm then, uh, and if you're allowed to, that a, a drainage application has been made? That might be one for Adam. Uh, he's nodding, so that that'd be a good start. But uh, I have seen drawings uh, of the uh, proposed implementation works. Yes. Okay. Same question to Adam, and just added add on to that: Is it looking favourable? We have received an application from PL. We've been working with them for a while and requesting they install a sufficient drainage provision. The previous applications weren't suitable for our requirements within public highway, but we did receive one last week that we're yet to review. So we'll get back to that on that shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Hogarth. Yeah. I just can't understand. We've got the education department saying there's capacity at April Primary, and the actual April Primary saying there's no capacity; it's full. And is that also before the take before the estate of a road is uh, occupied, which it will you know that'll have an impact? But someone from the education to clarify why we're getting these misleading, which is true. Yeah, this, this was a question, Councillor Hogarth, that came up on the committee site visit. Um, I have been in touch with our education team and have come back to me this morning, so I can perhaps give members a little bit more of an overview as to where we are with that. So um, the education team have uh, considered that they uh, look at the number of school places, the dwellings or the scheme will propose, uh, and as part of this development scheme, it's six additional primary school places. That's using a methodology, looking at uh, pupil projections, incorporating uh, current school census information, containing numbers of on-roll pupils, inward and outward migration, calculated at 18% out of the catchment area, new housing developments and additional places required as a result of those, school net capacity assessments, school cumulative admission numbers, ONS birth data, uh, and having looked at all of that information, all of those strands, they consider that the Hayfield Primary School can absorb the six additional places that will be generated from this development and therefore do not wish to apply any additional Section 106 monies. The school are currently operating at a capacity of 60 children per year group, which equates to 400, 420 places. The latest uh, census figures of the summer term 2022 
show 399 children on roll in the year's reception up to year six. This leaves 21 places available. And therefore, even with without sorry the adjustment of the 18% catchment area, inward migration, the school could absorb the six additional places required. So that gives you the clarity from our education team that there's a standard methodology, there's really up-to-date data that they're using, and they're confident on the basis that the development in terms of its scale could be absorbed into uh, the existing uh, requirement school places. Uh, and, and as I said, the the methodology does take into consideration new housing developments, so that would have taken into consideration 140 on the opposite side of the road. I think the important thing, just by way of advice for members there, is, uh, as Gary's just clearly demonstrated, it's a complex area, calculating school places. You've obviously heard things, members, previously, which has raised your concerns, but what is clear there is it's very formulaic, evidence-based, uh, which is everything that we need to progress on in terms of considering this application. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, do we have any other questions? Councillor Beach? Uh, yes, to get away from the road in the school, the properties. The ones that are, uh, can you put the sh shot up with the, the other side? The four-storey flats, which way are they orientated? Because I couldn't see that it's a good idea for people to be looking down on that busy junction. Um, it, it would, you know, it would be noisy for one thing. Are they sort of facing into the site or, or a mix? Yeah, it's a mix. It's a mix. It's um, part of the uh, importance of that corner is to frame it. So, in terms of kind of urban design. Uh, parameters that the quantum and, and scale for massing of that part of the site is considered acceptable because of its proximity to the other buildings of, uh, as part of DSA um, but you've also got to consider a kind of active street frontage what you wouldn't want to do is have blank elevations facing outwards from that corner because it would uh, have a negative impact in terms of the character of the overall development so there, there is an active frontage so um, the apartments will face out onto, onto that corner but they are set back far enough away from the junction it's not to be uh, overly noisy uh, those kind of things Do we have any other questions? Councillor Park Thank you, it's for, for Adam um, In regards to drainage and the works to be done that you've received application where on site would the soak away the, the concrete things be placed where well, the developers appeals looking to install drainage down the boundary of um, first avenue so initially we looked at the corner on the junction of peel of uh, first avenue and hayfield lane but there's insufficient space on that junction so it'll be a combination of those two corner junctions and then the verges down first avenue chair we can uh, if it's okay for uh, members we can table uh, show a plan if that's okay okay so the green areas that you can see here and then on the opposite side of the road, forgive me, because this is now working off the screen, uh, are the proposed uh, concrete uh, solutions that uh, the applicant has referred to. It's also important as well, I think we mentioned on site on, on Friday, uh, not all of First Avenue is as adopted highway. So that shows the extent of where the adopted highway starts and, and finishes, really. So everything south of that is is uh, is Peel's land, in effect. So. Um, in a, as I say, they're, they're the two solutions that have been proposed. Give, thank you for that, because that was the kind of thing I was looking for where the adoption is. So just, just for clarity, that towards the top of that, that drawing is DMBC. 
everything coming back this way is Peel. So given that, of it, lovely, Peel are going to pay 100% of it, it's on DMBC land and it's got the surface water that's coming from DMBC. Now, in that negotiation, I would assume that the authority said, oh, lovely, great, you're going to pay for it. Why have they not done this before? Because we've been inquiring since 2015 and you know. Now, I'm kind of sceptical of given that a contract's not been signed, that Peel have said, we're going to pay for it, but it's not. I'm, I'm, I'm given the school places and everything else, I am I'm lost at the moment. Yes, we need affordable properties. We definitely need pro affordable properties within our ward. Now, what I'm lost with is how this unviable proposition is being put. And I just, I'm sorry, but I can't support it. I think it's a difficult one because obviously this, uh, the drainage is outside the sanitation as well. So it's not something we're taking into consideration. And I fully understand what you're saying, what we've seen with it, but. Uh, that area is actually outside the consideration um, for this application. Um, in, 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 in our local plan, it gives many, many, many reasons of why school education um, should go with developments. What we're seeing from, from this authority is that the planning isn't in place to give school provision moving forward. It's waiting for somebody else to do it, which is the developers. Now, we've got policy number 52, new education facilities. We've got uh, section 13, 16, that says in there, um, go on, I just, I just got it. Our duty is to ensure su su sufficient school places are available to meet the needs of existing and new communities. We're seeing a lot of new communities, but we're not seeing any push to get these, these facilities in there and yeah I take it chair absolutely that it's outside of of that red line but it's still can it, if that's not sorted it could be it could be affecting people's mental health it could you know if you're already really sloshing going about it's going to do your head in isn't it but sorry I shall say no more thank you for that council Cox I totally understand where you're coming from on, on the issue of like I say it's outside of consideration for this application and I think excuse me within uh, the education side that's been explained the formula that's quite robust in their assessment that's been provided for us because it is a concern when looking at uh, new housing development our doctors our, our schools and everything it's uh, you know at the forefront of what we're all thinking I'm sorry. of course you can very 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 quick how many school places are at hayfield school the um the education team have, have requested. So as part of the, the updates that I've done and it is in the report, uh, I can find the paragraph 8.71. There's an update, uh, page 34. Um, the education team have re-looked really at it as, as described out on site. It's a bit of a moving feast in terms of it can change from month to month, year to year, uh, what the education uh, requirements are. Um, the, the actual contribution requirements have gone down. So the number of places needed for Hayfield School has gone from five to four. However, the financial contributions has gone up. So the, the number of, uh, the amount of money needed per place has gone up. Um, so it's actually gone from 91,000 to 107. Uh, so that there's less places needed but there's more money required in order to offset them um, so there is a, a need for four places what's important is there's there isn't a contribution required for primary school places um, and I think that's where members were concerned and what was discussed at the last meeting was or there was some debate about uh, the governor I think of the school had said that the the school was at capacity or over capacity what we're being told is from our education team is that that's not the case and that there's a calculation in order to derive that that figure i think what members need to be mindful of is if the, you were refusing planning permission it's very much based on data and information and if we haven't got data and information to counteract that we would leave yourself open to costs for unreasonable behavior Can I just come in with a 
you can and then we've got Councillor Stapleton. All right, Councillor Stapleton. Uh, thank you, Chair. Obviously, this is, is quite a complicated one, Gary, and I, I get it that some of the issues are not within for planning. Um, obviously, I'm, I've, you know, I'm looking at the um, impact on highway safety and, and everything else. Obviously, that, that potentially is mitigated by things that may happen outside planning. Um, as a way of praise, am I right in thinking that, that if members were a mind to, to grant, the concerns are only mitigated if Peel come through with their end of the deal with the developer. In other words, we're putting, as members, putting a hell of a lot of trust on Peel Holdings, holding up their part or playing their part in this play. And my concern at the minute, I don't have much trust in Peel Holdings to do what they say. So um, I'm hoping that, that, that they would do, as it's been alluded to, it's, it's part of a legal agreement. But am I right in thinking that there is, we would be granted this on, on a trust issue, really, if that makes sense. I, th I think what you've got to look at is is the principles of, of planning in association with what you've got in front of you. So what, what's been assessed is, uh, and, and what the drainage team have assessed, is whether this development can effectively look after itself through the sustainable drainage systems that are being proposed. Uh, and the answer to that question is yes. Uh, having received the information, it's been assessed and there is a suitable condition about the maintenance or future maintenance of that moving forward. What you've got is a secondary issue, which is an off-site long-standing issue, not of the making of the applicant and not of the making of this application site, that you've heard uh, from the applicant today, they're looking to resolve. Um, but it can't form part of the agreement of this planning permission if it was granted. It's a separate issue. Uh, and it has to be dealt with separately. Um, but you've heard today that the, the applicant's in legal discussions or has a legally binding document that would make sure that that would happen. It's just you can't you can't tie them in as part of this planning application. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, it's a tough one for your members. I do I do appreciate that. But as you're now starting to come to some form of uh, decision. Uh, or you will be in, in, in the very short future. It's just important to, uh, to, to reiterate that the scheme itself delivers a good mix of house types on site, which is in accordance with the National Planning Policy Framework. The number of houses have been reduced to take into consideration the protection of the most important trees on the site. That has inevitably had an impact even more so on the viability of the site and the viability has been tested rigorously, not only by the applicant, but also double checked by our own independent viability consultant. And ultimately, at the end of that, there is £7,000 profit uh, uh, to be uh, recognised. Now, as Gary mentioned, that is currently in your report and your recommendation uh, earmarked to go to affordable housing. It is in your gift as the decision maker, if you are minded to move to approve the application, that that be put to education. Uh, so, and just to reiterate, it is as, for those members who were on site, it's a brownfield site with a large swathe of uh, tarmac impermeable surface. And the proposal will pr introduce, uh, as Gary's mentioned, drainage that will ensure that the development site doesn't have any adverse impact above and beyond that that's already been experienced uh, on the site. Uh, and with the gardens and the soft landscaping and so on, that will only help uh, uh, the situation further. Uh, I'm gonna go as far as well, just to hopefully give members a little bit more comfort that uh, in the applicant, and I wouldn't normally say this, uh, they are an award-winning uh, applicant uh, uh, and have won awards in the uh, Doncaster area under the Local Authority Building Control uh, Award. So we, we are dealing with a credible company uh, and there are other works that, uh, and processes being undertaken which unfortunately you can't have consideration to, which Gary has mentioned because it's a separate drainage application, but the applicant as part of their presentation made the point that 
they don't want to be building houses that they can't sell because there are flood issues outside and uh, I think members uh, just need to take that uh, but ultimately it will be your decision. Thank you. Thank you for that Roy. Do we have any other questions? Councillor Hogarth. Yeah I'm still unsure about the school capacity. Somebody either deliberately or inadvertently is actually misleading us when we read this it says School capacity for summer 2020 was 420, but the school only has 360 pupils. That is inaccurate. It's claimed that there are 425 pupil, pupils. So, where where is that number? And if that number is already wrong, then how sure are we that the numbers we're stating we've got now are accurate? You know, which, which do we believe? I think you'll find that the uh, 420 is the school at full capacity, so that's the maximum number of, of students that they would be allowed in. So I'm assuming that's that number uh, there, Councillor Hogarth. There's, it's claimed that there are 425 pupils. And then so, but the someone's saying 262. Uh, which is correct. Oh, oh. Somebody is giving us. I think the wrong. update that Gary gave us, he told us there's 420 places. I think he said 399 on roll leaving the capacity of 21 places of, available. So I think that was the latest figures that uh, were provided to us. Yeah, that's that's right, Chair. So f 420 places, so 60 children per year group, 420 places. Uh, there are the summer term, so the term that's just gone from 2022, so last year's last term, was showed 399 children on roll. So that, that gave 21 places available. So that's the most up-to-date and most accurate information we've got from our education team. Do we have any other questions? No? Is there a proposal to grant planning permission subject to the conditions and the signing of Section 106 agreement? I'll move it. It's been moved and seconded. Those in favour, can you raise your hands, please? Yeah? Those against? Thank you. The application's passed. Application two is planning application two one oblique zero two three nine nine oblique FUL. Formation of a new site entrance from Worcester Avenue at Compton Light in Limited Wheatley Hall Road, Wheatley. And I'm going to pass that over to Mark to present. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, okay, right. okay, this application is at the site of the former Crompton Lighting Factory, now known as Zenin Park. Currently, there's shared access with goals, football pitches, which leads to a gate, car parks, and access roads that circulate around the site. Due to civil, uh, due to civil arrangements, if the use is changed then the site, within the site, rather, then the occupants may no longer be able to use the existing arrangements. Hence the need to create a separate access to the site. The application was deferred in June in order to receive further information in relation to the impact on trees affected by the development. Just to refresh members on the proposal, 
there's a possibility that northeastern part of the site might be developed and permission has has been approved allowing the creation of a new access to Reedy Hall Road, but the development of new buildings would cut this off from the rest of the site. New buildings and reconfiguration of the eastern end of the factory building would need separate consent should this come to fruition. And it's not part of the, uh, of not part of considering this application. So here's an aerial view uh, with the extent of the site highlighted yellow forming part of the employment policy area that lies along the south side of Wheatley Hall Road. The redevelopment by a mix of housing and commercial development in the mixed use allocation to the north and established housing to the west and to the south. The application came to committee due to the number of representations made. Matters raised were loss of amenity through noise, disturbance and delivery traffic passing and turning close to dwellings. Changes in character and appearance uh, from adjacent dwellings as well. Currently there's a weight restriction next to the existing entrance preventing through traffic proceeding uh, along, sorry, uh, proceeding through Wheatley along Worcester Avenue and all heavy traffic is pro prohibited from Litchfield Road. The TRO is except for access, so traffic proceeding to a new entrance would not be contravening the TRO directly. Vehicles would, however, pass uh, the front of the 10 dwellings on the opposite side of Worcester Avenue to get to and from the new entrance. Earlier this year, the applicant recorded a number of movements in and out of the site and was shown that to be very small in terms of commercial traffic. Therefore, harm to these dwellings would be limited. In order to limit the potential disturbance, a condition requiring a traffic management plan to limit the movement so that commercial traffic entering and leaving the site would be directed to and from Wheatley Hall Road. It would also in the in include the provision to agree times of operation. Another concern was that vehicles would be able to turn in and out of the site without affecting parked cars on the road. And the tracking has shown that an entrance could be designed so that this shouldn't occur and vehicles are able to manoeuvre within the site. So I have a couple of recent shots, first showing the existing access with the car park goals to the left of the access and the access road bending round to the right to the main gate of Zenin Park. This may have to close, hence the proposal for a new access directly from Worcester Avenue and into the adjacent car park. Uh, this is a view looking south within the existing access uh, on the left, sorry, with the existing access on the left with the weight restriction signs just beyond. And this is a view looking north back towards the existing entrance and new entrance, and the new entrance would be on the right hand side. In policy terms, proposals considered to be located within a sustainable location on existing employment site in the local plan and thus weighs considerably in favour of the application. The noise and disturbance associated with the extra vehicle movements is potentially significant in terms of the occupants of nearby dwellings. However, the app, um, impact is limited and can be restricted by the imposition of uh, the traffic management plan. Short-term noise and disturbance associated with implementing the planning permission is considered to carry limited weight. This is a couple of street view images from spring last year before they became came into leaf and where it can be seen that trees have been heavily pollarded. Uh, and the view further up Wooster Avenue shows the trees close to where the new access is proposed in a similar state. The tree officer was not concerned regarding the removal but did want to see proper assessment and also replacement planting. The tree report was produced by the applicant and identified the trees to come out on the frontage. Due to the net loss that would result from this, opportunities for replacement planting elsewhere on the site were investigated. The updated plan shown here in the appendix of your report shows five uh, Acer platin platinoids, which are silver birch, and two Betula pendula Norway maples uh, located alongside the driveway that runs along the northern extent of the main building. A condition requiring that they be planted in the first available season following development is proposed along with the requirement that they be maintained and if necessary replaced within the five years following planting. In summary, the proposal is considered to be located within a sustainable location of an existing employment site. Uh, the, therefore, the context of the, in the context of the presumption in favour of sustainable development, proposals recommended for approval subject to the proposed conditions. So we're now going to go into the debate section. Do we have any questions? Wow. <laughs>
Is there a proposal to grant planning permission? Right, so we've got a mover, uh, can I speak to your seconder? Uh, can we have a show of hands in favour then, please? That's been agreed, thank you. Application number three is planning application 21 of leak 03150 of leak FUL, which is the erection of a detached double garage and extending driveway to the front at 27 Doncaster Road in Kirksample. And that's not Dave Richard that's presenting it. Rebecca. <laughs> We've got Rebecca presenting it. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm presenting on behalf of Dave, who is unable to um, make planning committee this afternoon. Uh, this application is a household application for a detached double garage and extended driveway to the front of number 27 Doncaster Road. Uh, you can see the site uh, boundary there on the uh, overhead image. Uh, so attached is the site plan, and you can see. Um, the positioning of the double garage. Uh, the height of the garage is 4.3 metres, uh, so sort of a ordinary height for um, a domestic garage. And the house is a two-storey property, uh, which is quite large. And you can sort of see the comparison in terms of the footprint um, appears sort of secondary to the main do main dwelling. Um, here is an overhead photo. There are some uh, trees and shrubs along the front boundary, so it's predominantly uh, screened from the highway. And as you could see from the previous uh, site plan, it's set well back from the highway. So here we've got the um, elevation drawings of the garage. Uh, the materials are proposed to match the existing dwelling. Um, so it'll tie in well with um, the main house and the surrounding area. Um, all the properties along Doncaster Road vary uh, in terms of the styles. Um, so this one, the garage would tie in well with the main dwelling and almost appear as if it was uh, sort of an original property. Um, here are some uh, site photographs. You can see the um, property is well screened by sort of hedges and shrubs. Um, another photo there you can see it'll be sort of slightly screened by um, the greenery there to the front and again along Doncaster Road there uh, so the garage would sit just slightly in front of the fence which is existing uh, between the front elevation of the house going along to the side boundary um, and the paving would be extended sort of just in front of that as you can see on the uh, previous site plan um, having regard to all the matters I think the detached garage would tie in well with the host well and it's not got any concerns in relation to neighbouring amenity they've received no objections um, and no objection from consultees so would be minded to grant planning permission Thank you for that Rebecca do we have any questions? No? Oh, Councillor Algar. Yeah, it's just going to clarify. They gave them the previous, like, it's like consent to uh, Crown One Horse Chestnut uh, by 2023. And yet, and later, it's got to remove One Horse Chestnut by 2023. Was it removed because of the uh, crowning for a few years? And is there any chance, if this is granted, of damage to any more of the trees on site? The tree officer has been consulted and he raised no concerns in relation to the trees. Um, there has been an uh, informative in relation to the trees added um, onto the f a um, decision. Um, although the tree officers raised no objections and doesn't believe that the proposed garage would harm any of the uh, trees or greenery in the surrounding area. 
Thank you for that. Any other questions, councillors? Okay, thank you. Is there a proposal to grant planning permission? Councillor Stapleton, thank you. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Farmer, and we show advance in favour of the application, please. Application, therefore, passes. Um, okay, the next item on the agenda is item uh, number six. This report is for information only. Does any member wish to speak on this item? I thought we had some new uh, councillors at the back then wanting to speak with hands waving. <laughs> okay, uh, that then uh, closes the meeting. Uh, members, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes business for today. Thank you for attending.